Yes, you remind me of a time when I spent a wonderful day with Dr. Greg Kahete, who's a Tewa Indian from the American Southwest. And uh, I asked him, what's the difference between the way the white man does science and the way the red man does science? Because he knew both cultures. And he said, the white man does science by t isolating a piece of nature, taking it into the laboratory, and studying it for the purpose of controlling. And the red man, to study the same phenomenon, goes into nature because his goal is to integrate with nature, to understand his integration within the ecosystem. And this was a very good distinction. Uh, it makes sense, and you understand how the Western scientific perspective of pretending there's a world objectively out there apart from us. I don't like the word environment. It's an it, it's impersonal, it's separate. If you think ecosystem, you're within it, you're part of it, and you have to take into consideration what happens to it will happen to you, as another Chief Seattle Indian said. Yeah. You know, what you do to the earth is what you do to yourself. And when you take the worldview that everything is oneness within consciousness, then you're aware that everything is alive and intelligent and you're interacting with it. And indigenous people were literally in communion with it. White man, Western science, objective view, one world view, discovered communication. This is very different from communion. We're working on communication and we gave up communion to do it. You see, it's an exercise. Uh, to me, the whole universe is an anything can happen, anything will happen that can happen. We're making it up as we go. We plan out these things at a psychic level, at a soul level, whatever, as group souls. Let's play this game. Let's see how much we can move away from source and pretend that we're separate from it and still find our way home. But what, why did we do that? Is that a natural instinct, do you think? Or was that us getting greedy or too excited? Or what was, what was the, mm. what, 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 why did the human mind do that? Why did God mind do all the diversity of, well, that's, that's the, of that's the That's the bigger question. You see, yeah. to me, our little minds reflect, in some sense, big mind. If I think okay. of cosmic consciousness, okay. and I'm within it, and Every bit of consciousness has what William James called a perch and a flight. Uh, it has a focus. There's a center to it. I experience myself as conscious. But my consciousness has no limits. It's as broad as whatever my conception of the universe is. If I wake up tomorrow and scientists have said the universe is ten times bigger than we thought, I say, okay, I just, my consciousness takes that in. Right? So I have both the perch and the flight, and I overlap with every other consciousness. We are oneness, but we each have an absolutely unique perspective on the whole. So no two people can have identical realities. You see, we, have, we each have our absolutely unique window in the world, and so does every bacterium and every ant and every cell uh -huh. in my body. It's a, it's a wonderful kind of rich diversity where the sum total of everything is making things up as it goes because it is consciousness and matter in one, like a keyboard. Imagine the low keys are matter, the low frequencies. Okay. Yeah. And the middle range is uh, electromagnetic energy. Einstein showed us that they were one and the same, right? E equals mc squared. Energy is transformable into matter and vice versa. The upper end of the keyboard is where consciousness soul, mind, spirit, are in the high keys. So the people who come from religions or from consciousness orientations are looking down the keyboard from the high vibrations, and the scientists who are in the world of matter are looking up the keyboard from the low vibrations, and they don't see that they're on the same keyboard until now when we can recognize, okay, the universe is all frequencies, and we're all matter and spirit and energy. We're not a body with a soul. We're a mind, soul, body, feelings, entity, complete, whole keyboard. <laughs> so somehow, 
consciousness is having an experiment that involves us and maybe that's all part of the master plan or the adventure that they're mm. having consciousness that we would somehow lose our focus a little bit go off in the wrong direction mm -hmm. so we would have the experience mm -hmm. of finding back our focus yes. again yes. and that's our challenge now isn't it to a large extent yes absolutely that is the challenge and I, I like adventure better than master plan uh, because yes. I I think the whole thing is an adventure. The cosmos is an adventure. And here we are, co-creators, within this great, wonderful scheme of, of this beautiful planet, this nature, and we have the ability to recreate our whole human society any way we want it to be. Isn't it? It's amazing. You know, we're born into a system of money and, and a way of doing things. And most of us don't really snoop into that the way I have um, to see that this is all human invention, the way we've run our society. Everything you see around us was in somebody's mind before it, you know, was created. But how did it get in somebody's mind? Ah, how does a thought come into your mind? Yeah. How did thought come into God mind? Maybe we can't answer that question, yeah. but we know thoughts arise, they come and go, and we have a choice of which ones to pursue and which ones not to pursue, of which ones to materialize and which ones not to materialize. That's the glory of free choice. We do, and we're very influenced, of course, by society and by media and other people, and that does influence the choices we make some sometimes. Um, mm, I, I know for myself that's the mm. case. Um, so where we are at the moment is there's a lot of doom and gloom on the planet. Mm. Um, statistics show us that things are going to get a lot worse it seems. But I know you're very positive about mm -hmm. our options and where we can go. Mm. And you see kind of lots of lots of opportunities for us in this situation. Yeah, first of all, because of my evolution biology approach of maturation cycles, I see that humans are very much now in this transition phase to a mature form in which we're much more cooperative. Secondly, I see that all through evolution, crises always drove the greatest innovation. So that for Earth has been through uh, five great extinctions in which up to 95% of all life forms were wiped out by huge planetary climate disasters. So what, what, what were those? There was the one, the last one was the dinosaurs. The last one was the dinosaurs. Well, a meteor hit right, there. a me big yeah. meteor. We don't need to recount all the others. The main yeah. point is that when things become so disrupted by yeah. crisis, you don't get one at a time slow Darwinian lineages branching into new things. The Earth behaves as a single ecosystem, a single living system, and all over it, new species pop up in so the midst of these crises. In effect. It's like a blossoming suddenly, okay. and you see them all at once in the fossil record. Yeah. And so, and think about humans. Every time there's a flood or a war or some other disaster, people suddenly who were supposed to be innately uncooperative, competitive, Darwinian suddenly are cooperating to get things done, rolling up yeah. their sleeves, helping each other, being in the mature mode. So it's in us. It's in us to do that. But just like other species, like the bacteria went through the crisis before they cooperated, and then the big cells went through crisis before they formed the multicelled creatures, we also, even though we can build future scenarios, yeah. seem to be pushed into our maturity like other species. Well, the push is on now. We've got yeah. the collapse of, of a financial system that was designed to be unfair. And some people have used it very well. I know businessmen who have gone in with a mission of serving uh, their customers so well that they did it beautifully. 